Hello, and welcome to the World Optometry webinar. You're all very welcome, and thank you very much for joining us wherever you are in the world. My name is Lorcan, and I am the moderator for today's um, webinar presentation, and I'm joined by my colleague Shaiva, who will be in the background, and Shaiva will be able to give you any technical assistance you may require. Before we start today's presentation, I just want to go through some general housekeeping rules with you. So the first housekeeping rule is just have your cameras off and your microphones off, please. And this is just to minimize the amount of background noise uh, and feedback, which can be quite distracting for both our guest speaker and also fellow attendees. I'd also like you to rename your electronic device with the same name you, record, you entered for today's presentation. This is very important to receive your certificate of attendance. So the name of the electronic device should be the same name you registered for, for the webinar. So if you're not too sure how to do that, if you just move the cursor down to participants, you'll see your name. And if you hover the cursor over your name, you'll have an option to rename the electronic device. Please post any questions you may have for our guest speaker in the chat function. And you can do this at any time during the presentation. Our guest speaker will address these questions at the end of the presentation. Shaiva, my colleague, will be able to assist you with any technical issues you may have. So if you have any issues with sound or picture, Please don't prefer to mention in the chat box and we'll respond to you very, very quickly. To receive your certificate of attendance today, there are one or two things you have to do, and that's to engage with the presentation. Don't prefer to ask any questions. Also, you'll be asked to uh, complete a questionnaire at the end of the uh, presentation. We'll email you uh, an email with certain questions, just asking for your feedback. And also to as well, you must remain on the webinar for the full duration. So today's presentation will last approximately 35 to 40 minutes, and then we'll have a live question and answer session with our guest speaker for 10 to 15 minutes. I'm delighted to present our guest speaker today. Uh, we have uh, a wonderful speaker from Malaysia, and his name is Mr. Woon Pak Siong. And Mr. Siong is an optometrist and also an orthokeratologist in Malaysia. So what I'll do is in a moment, I'll pass over to Mr. Siong. And just to today's title is talking about myopia management, myopia control. So the title of today's topic is a look at myopia control. So I'll pass it over to you, Mr. Siong. Thank you very much, Loken, and uh, also to Shavia for the kind invitation to uh, share with you uh, what I know about myopia control. So let me just share my screen. Right, okay. So today we're gonna to look at myopia control, um, but I think before we, we proceed further, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Woon uh, Pak Seong, and I graduated as an optometrist from the National University of Malaysia, Malaysia. And thereafter, I've worked for optometry practices in a chain store for one and a half years. And thereafter, seven and a half years in a single uh, optometry center before starting up on my own in 2004. Um, I currently have two practices and we have uh, a total of nine optometries with, with us. So I am no scientist, but I'm just a practitioner uh, who enjoys doing what I do, practicing optometry, as well as uh, my uh, working together with my team to serve the vision needs as well as the eye care needs of our patients. So myopia control. So a little bit about my background. The other thing about my background is I remember that um, I started wearing uh, glasses when I was uh, at seven years old and I've been wearing spectacles ever since. Um, my mom and I doesn't wear spectacles at all, at all until she had presbyopia. And if you were to trace back uh, her, her sight, none of, the, none of her sight wore glasses. On my dad's side, my dad has antimetropia. That means one side has short-sightedness and the other one is uh, long-sighted. Um, but on, on his side, nearly everyone wears glasses. So, so thus is my journey in, in, in myopia and wearing glasses since the age uh, seven. So we know that um, the myopia prevalence and especially, especially when the, the study by Brian Holden et al. in 2016 says that uh, by the year 2050, out of the whole world's population, half of the world's population will be myopic, 
more short-sighted and about a billion will have high short-sightedness or above um, minus five diopters or 500 as we call it in, in Malaysia. Now this is alarming because everywhere in the world, uh, none, no one is spared um, from the increase in myopia. So if you look at it, uh, if you look at the whole world, every part of the uh, world is affected by myopia. And particularly in East Asia, uh, where we come from, uh, East, uh, East Asia, Asia Pacific and Southeast Asia, a lot more people are getting myopic and it's going at an alarming rate. During my time, when I was about seven years old, it is um, very uncommon. It is not common to find people who are myopic. So if you are myopic, you are the odd person out. Um, but nowadays, uh, flashback to now, if you are not myopic, then you'll be the odd person out in Malaysia. Uh, in fact, unfortunately, sometimes you see uh, children celebrating that they get to wear glasses because finally they join the rest of the family. So. Those days, we were all talking about it. I mean, if, if you are just myopic, you can just correct it with a pair of glasses or contact lenses. So what's the big deal? However, now we know that if myopia is not controlled, then um, the, the risk of eye disease is so much more. And especially if you have pathological myopia where um, everything else, um, it's worse. So what do we do? What are the... Uh, things that we do. I think it is only in the recent 10 over years that uh, myopia management has gained strength. And, and by now, a lot of people are focused, I mean, a lot of optometrists and opticians are focusing on myopia management. But, you know, but people were searching for solutions way, uh, probably 20, 30 years ago. And, and those days, people were talking about, are there any eye exercises for us to um, slow down short-sightedness and some people were starting to wear sandbags or small weights you know in attempt to slow down short-sightedness so there was a demand to slow down short-sightedness but none of these um, ways uh, seems to be repeatable you know uh, has scientific evidence and works on everyone so but what do we have now what are the options to do, do we have now so it is pretty much um, divided into three. Um, of course, there is another a lifestyle element which I'll talk, touch on later. So the easiest one would be spectacles or spectacle lenses in the form of a bifocal or a multifocal. The second type will be contact lenses when you have either soft contact lenses or via orthokeratology. And lastly, pharmaceutical uh, pharmacological uh, intervention in the form of atropine or myopine. So in terms of spectacle lenses, um, 20 years ago, I mean, I still remember when I, when I started, um, when I started uh, uh, working as an, as an optometrist, parents would always, always often say that, what could you reduce the prescription for my kid, for example, if the prescription is minus three doctors, could you drop it by, by 050 or 075, you know, so that the short signs do not increase so fast. But studies done by Chung et al. in 2002 and uh, Vasudevan et al. in 2014 shows that um, if we um, undercorrect the, the short sightedness, now this would result in an a far faster increase in myopia. And Dr. Chung uh, Kaming uh, is actually my lecturer. Uh, I was blessed to have him as a lecturer in the National, National University of Malaysia. So we know now that under correction doesn't work. And in fact, it wasn't uh, myopia. Now, the next one that came in was accommodative lag. Now, what is a commodative lag? That means that um, for someone who looks at far, the vision is clear, but when the person looks at near, um, instead of the amount of accommodation needed to accurately focus the near object to the retina, um, there is a, a mismatch. That means we use lesser. 
uh, than the accommodation needed, right? So, so therefore, so that time, um, my multifocal or bifocal were suggested. So there was the the options available um, to address uh, accommodative lack. So this is found um, in recent years. Uh, I mean, it started with the bifocal quite some time ago, and and then came Zeiss Myo Kids, uh, SLO Myopilux Plus, and also in the form of bifocal in SLO Myopilux Max, which is executive bifocal with a base in prisms. Now, according to the studies, now according to the studies, there's very um, uh, results in terms of efficacy. So if you look at the chart, uh, you know, one group says that the prismatic bifocal, um, you know, has 51% uh, rate of myopia reduction compared to bifocals, which is 39%. Uh, PALS would be progressive lenses, 13%, ranges from 13% to 24%. But if you look at various studies, various studies will contradict each other and so on. And one of the things that I, I the other thing that we can question would be, uh, whether uh, the other elements uh, is it controlled or not. Uh, that means the amount of time spent outdoors, the amount of time uh, reading and so on. Uh, so we get a quite a number of different different rates happening with different different studies. So after the um, the progressive or, or bifocals came in, then the next one was uh, a myopic defocus uh, lenses. So principally, myopic defocus means that in a normal prescription lenses or normal contact lenses, while the center part of the vision is focused on the retina, whatever is in the peripheral is focused behind the retina. And, and this um, myopic defocus, um, uh, sorry, this hyper... Uh, this hyperopic defocus right at the corner um, sends a signal to the brain to elongate the eye and thus making the eye even more myopic. Now, so what happened was they, they wanted um, to have a myopic defocus lenses, which basically means that the lenses, the center part is still focused clearly on the retina or whatever is in the peripheral, peripheral, the focus is brought into the eyeball and thus uh, cuts off the signal or reduces the signal to elongate the eye. So this is found in contact lenses as well as um, spectacle lenses as well. So in terms of spectacle lenses, um, for us in Malaysia, it all started with uh, Zeiss Myovision um, quite a number of years ago. Um, and then we had the launch of my Hoya Mio Smart in 2019, and we are anticipating um, SLO Stellus probably next year. So it's not launched in Malaysia yet. So these three lenses work on the same myopic uh, defocus principle. The difference for uh, between Zeiss and, and Hoya Mio Smart would be Hoya Mio Smart um, has a ring of honeycomb micro lenses all around it. And we have yet to see what is uh, SLO status. So according to the studies by Lam et al. and as well as Bao et al. for Hoya Dims as well as SLO status, they seem to be uh, far more effective compared to the previous generation of lenses using uh, progressive or addition. So in uh, Hoya Dims is about 59% and SLO status 67%. Um, but I've yet to verify it because uh, we have yet to get uh, to have gotten SLO status. So contact lenses. So when it comes to contact lenses, um, we have uh, Cooper Vision my, my Sight one day. Uh, it has a dual focus and it works on the same concept of my big defocus as well. Um, so, but in my, in my it's available in Malaysia However, um, the, uh, the cost is quite prohibitive uh, in Malaysia, so it is not as popular because of cost reasons. Um, therefore, there, this is the studies on the uh, uh, effectiveness of uh, soft multifocal uh, lenses as well as the dual focus as well as uh, my sight. 
So we have a range of efficacy from 25% to 59%. Also keratology. So also keratology is, we know that it's a lens that, um, that uh, a, a patient wears to sleep. And while, we, while, while, we, while the patient sleeps with the lenses, the lenses actually causes a shift in cells of the front part of the eye called the cornea. And it, it does two things. Number one, it uh, creates the surface that allows myopic defocus to happen. And secondly, it also reduces myopia for the day so that one can the patient can function the whole day without spectacles, without contact lenses, without any form of correction for a day. And therefore, at night, they, they would want need to wear back the also K lenses again because the cornea will try to go back to its original shape. The effectiveness of uh, also keratology ranges from 32% to 52%. So next would be pharmacological treatment. In terms of pharmacological treatment, um, it was in the form of atropine. In fact, um, in Malaysia for quite some time ago, um, it was actually more popular in Singapore than in, in Malaysia, where we have actually had patients who go down to Singapore uh, for atropine uh, treatment. And But those days, atropine was a stronger concentration and therefore um, the patient do complain of glare uh, and also it also causes um, a, a lack of accommodation. Um, but nowadays, you have myopin in the form of 0.01% in Malaysia. The 0.02% 0.025% is not available in Malaysia yet. And uh, this is a uh, treatment of choice by the ophthalmologist in Malaysia, uh, where uh, it, it temporary, we, the mechanisms of atropine is still not very well known yet, but uh, we postulate that it temporarily paralyzes the focusing muscle and therefore uh, allows it to slow down myopia. So from the studies, um, ranging from 27% to all the way to 75%. Now, behavioral modification is important uh, in, when it comes to myopia management. I mean, all the others are in the form of uh, therapy and intervention, but this, um, all this therapy and intervention will, will not uh, be enough without behavioral modification, which means that we need to take a break. For example, like visual hygiene, when we follow the 20-20-20 rule where for every 20 second, uh, every 20 minutes of uh, near work to take a 20 second break and looking at something 20 feet away. And of, of course, also economic setup, meaning that you want to do work at a far further distance. Um, to limit the screen time, uh, these are some of the uh, uh, recommended screen time by WHO and AAP, and as well as to have outdoor activities at least 2.5 hours per day or as long as possible. Now, the outdoor activities is highly recommended and is proven uh, to be one of the most effective way. So in the future, um, what is available in the future? I think that there's going to be a lot more things in the future. One of the things that I looked at was uh, this. Uh, to the Kubota glass technology, but it does my PT focus, but we're yet to see it, but you know, this is quite interesting. And uh, so all of us as optometrists, I think all parents are concerned um, about um, ways to slow down short-sightedness because they know that if both parents are short-sighted and therefore their kids, they didn't want their kids to have as high a myopia as them. And therefore we will be calling to uh, to intervene, to, to help them to slow down uh, myopia as much as possible. So these are the references. And there you go. And, and that's it. And, and before I, 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 I pass it back to Loken, I just want to uh, thank uh, Yilin. Yilin uh, uh, has been helping me with this, all these slides and doing the research for me. Thank you very much. Back to you, uh, Logan. Thank you very much, Mr. Boon. That was a very exciting, very engaging presentation. 
Uh, for the attendees, I'm in the UK, and this is one of the largest uh, topical subjects here with regard to kind of uh, what's hot in optometry. Um, so myopia control and myopia management is very, very big at the present moment. So thank you very much, Mr. Moon, for giving some wonderful insight. Um, if anybody has any questions for Mr. Moon, please uh, put them into the chat box function at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we do have a few prepared questions for you, Mr. Boone, if it's okay with you. I'm just going to get my colleague Shiva just to share them on the screen so our attendees can see them. So for our attendees, we do tend to um, ask you these questions when you register, if you do have any questions for our guest speaker. So the first question, Mr. Boone, is according to which causes or reasons we consider the myopia will be more increasing, especially in Asian countries in the future? Um, even I think one of the big thing is genes. Um, we've known that uh, if both parents are myopia, myopic, and therefore uh, if both both parents are myopic, then the children will be more myopic. I think we we, we do see that uh, rapidly over here. However, we cannot blame it on just on genes alone. Um, I think in 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 Malaysia especially, we don't spend enough time outdoors. Um, we tend to spend more time indoors and, and time in front of uh, doing a lot more near work. And of, of the other thing in Malaysia is that also, I think also probably in, in Asian countries would be a, a too much emphasis on, on education. So a child can be spending nearly a good nine or probably 12 hours studying and we hardly get to spend time outdoors. And uh, I think that is one of the big causes for myopia. Thank you very much. Um, there's a second question too as well, Shaver, if you'd like to share that one, please. So how does the accommodative lag be reduced with ad power and the special near vision design, please? Okay. Now, we know that uh, the hypothesis is, is that the higher the hyperopic defocus, the greater the accommodative lag, and therefore the faster the rate of myopia progression. So by using an ad, uh, by using an ad, so basically um, a, myo a myopic, uh, diff that means, okay, when someone looks at far, the focus is on the retina, but when someone look at near, that object is focused behind the, behind the retina. And this, and um, while looking at near, if the eye can do a proper accommodation, that means the whatever is behind the retina is pull, uh, is focused back on the retina. But if there is a lag, that means there's a mismatch between uh, this accommodative effort, then that would lead uh, to an increase in myopia. Now, but when we do a an addition, so essentially we are pushing the uh, we're helping the eye to focus better on the retina and therefore um, slow down myopia progression. Okay. I've just got a, a personal question to you as well, Mr. Moon. In terms of the ad strength, is it always the maximum strength you'd give? Um, I think in, in Malaysia, it's quite popular to give an additional 150. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Because here in the UK, sometimes it can be an ad of two or a 250. Yeah. So the third question we have is, what is the earliest age we can start atropine and for how long can we use it? Um, the earliest age prescribed by WHO is six to six years old, and and the kid must have uh, a myopia of about minus one diopter, and an increase of 0.5 diopter every year. So they recommend it for a kid as young as six. Although ophthalmologists in Malaysia do start it earlier if they have if they have a uh, high myopia even at the younger age. Okay. One, two more questions. So can we consider adding other treatment modalities to control myopia progression? For example, ortho K, including atropine therapy. So more combination therapies, I think, is the, the question here. Yeah. I think combination therapies are popular, especially in Malaysia. We are trying them. Uh, in fact, even the ophthalmologists, are, um, I mean, I, I work with quite a fair bit of ophthalmologists in terms of myopia management. So a little bit about Malaysia. Um, Malaysia, in, in Malaysia, the optometrists cannot prescribe myopin. Yeah, they're not allowed to uh, by the laws in the country. So what happens is that we work very closely with the ophthalmologists 
and uh, the ophthalmologist and us favor combination treatments in particular, for example, like uh, uh, myopia control spectacles like Hoya Myosmart or Zeiss, uh, myokids together with atropine. So that seems to be uh, the way uh, to go. Um, in terms of K, we do not have cases where we combine K and atropine because K seems to be working pretty well without atropine uh, uh, combination. Okay, thank you. Just going to a question we have submitted in our chat function, Mr. Wun. Uh, good evening, Mr. Wun. By your experience, how to manage parents who are aware of the kids are having an increase in power of myopia but refuse myopia control? So again, quite a, a sensitive subject, but how would you approach that? Okay. Um, I think we, we can't force parents to, you know, uh, take my, to, to have their kids on my peer control. But I, I think parents are always concerned about um, their, their children and, and, and then typically they want the best for their children. Um, so normally what I do is, um, so parents who do not, I mean, I think number one is it is our job to explain to everyone about the availability of myopia control. And if, if it is suitable for their, uh, and if it's suitable for their children, obviously if the child has, has uh, only astigmatism or only um, hyperopia and so on, you, you don't do that. So, but if children has uh, myopia and is increasing every year, then it is our duty to tell them what is myopia, what is myopia management, what are the things available now, so that they are informed. You know? So the, the worst thing that we can do is not to tell them that it's available. And, but having said that, even if you tell them it's available and they, and they refuse myopia management, it is fine. I think what we'll do is at least they know uh, that this is happening. And so in, in my practice, I insist on seeing um, my patients who are kids every six months at the minimum and the, at, at the minimum is every six months regardless whether they are they have myopia or they have uh, or they are or even if, if they are emetopia i'll see them every six months and we can track the progress there and so if they if they have myopia and and, and, and they do not want myopia control so we can prescribe them on glasses and we will follow up with them every six months but once the myopia grows up pretty fast i'm, I'm pretty sure that the the, the parents will want um, some form of myopia control, be it glasses or even um, atropine, um, also K and, and so on. They will want to. But if they don't want, then then the owners, at least we have done. I mean, it's exactly like like doctors, you know. We, we are like, I mean, we are like physicians. We know that this, there's a disease and, and we tell them what is available. But if they refuse treatment, we, we can't do anything. Yeah. Yeah, I think it can be quite easy to discuss myopia control with myopic parents, but for somebody who maybe has emetropic parents, it can be quite difficult too as well. And that's yes. where sometimes you use the risk profile tool. So a lot of the myopia management uh, companies would actually have risk profile um, information yes. kits. And kind of you can do this in your practice within kind of room. Brian Holden, Vision Institute have it, and you can just kind of show the parents the risk factors of the child progressing. Thank you. Well, but um, uh, yeah. if I can add on, one of the things that I've done... One of the things that I've done is this. Um, I do even have people who are myopic, uh, children who are myopic who refuse glasses. And the children are clearly myopic, but they refuse glasses. So, so I would do this as well as do uh, uh, with myopic control as well as with this case, whereby I will tell parents that I think it is the best interest for your child to get a pair, of, to correct the short-sightedness, or I think that it is the best interest of your child to get myopia management, but it is fine. You don't really have to get it from me, but you can get it from someone else. So when that, uh, when you put that in that in that kind of light, then the parents will see that, hey, this person is not trying to sell something to me, but it wants what's in the best interest of my child you know, and doesn't mind if I go somewhere else to get it. So, but often, more often than not, they will return back and say, yeah, we want the manipulative management from you. Yeah. I think from a medical legal point of view too, as well as documenting that information you give to the parents, uh, just in case they do kind of query it six months or a year later down the line that it wasn't discussed or it wasn't offered. So quite important. And that's one of the things that practitioners here in the UK probably tend to be a little bit scared of. I mean, the duty of care to mention these things to our uh, patients. I have another question just come through on the chat function, Mr. Boone. Could you propose me any good papers focusing on the multifocal 
contact lens construction dedicated for myopia control. Okay. I, I don't do myopia control, myopia uh, contact lenses for myopia control, but I'll be more than happy to uh, get it for you. Uh, I mean, if you can write it to my email, I'll be more yeah, than happy. I, I think my, my fellow optometrist at Cooper Vision would, would love to furnish you with this information. Yeah, that question came from Idris Gafur. So Idris, if you'd be able to email that question to Mr. Woon at the end of the presentation, Mr. Woon's email address will be made on the screen in, in a few moments. Um, I've got one further question too as well. Uh, so last question, uh, Mr. Woon. So are we expecting an increase in myopia due to COVID generation spending more screen and indoor time? Um, I think that is a resounding yes. If, in fact, even this, uh, so just to give you an idea, Malaysia has, Malaysia has been on a lockdown um, uh, because of COVID since 18th of March, um, 18th of March, 2020. And even though there are times where we were not under lockdown, but we were encouraged to stay indoors. Um, so we have children who, who, who did, uh, who were online, doing online education from since 18th of March until now. And it's only within the next couple of weeks that some of them, we are doing a trial of going back to school. So when, when we saw them, we majority of them, I would say, would have an increase in myopia. And what is um, interesting enough is that we do see older generations who are turning myopic. I, I don't know whether that, that's the same case in, uh, in, in the UK, Logan, but I do see people who are in their 50s, in their 60s, um, they, they're supposed to, uh, their myopia is supposed to drop, but their, their myopia is going up instead. So, um, yeah. So, and then, of course, the other advocate would be going outdoors because we are not spending uh, time outdoors. And we know that uh, going outdoors, um, studies have, sh have postulated that because we are outdoors, um, the, our retina secretes out uh, dopamine, which helps in the slowing down of uh, Myopia, and obviously, when we are not outdoors, then the, the myopia increases. Thank you. Yes, I probably agree with that, Mr. Ruin, that we are seeing an increase in the myopia at, at all different ages, not just children. It's very important to kind of chat to these kind of you know patients uh, at all times about different management options for spectacles, contact lenses, etc. So this is Mr. Ruin's email address. If anybody has any queries or any questions, um, so what I'd like to be able to do next is just kind of say thank you, Mr. Ruin, for your. Um, presentation again. It was very insightful. It gives a lot of information. Thank you for your time. And for our attendees, our delegates, thank you very much for attending today and hopefully you enjoyed that. Um, your thoughts are very important to us. So we will be asking you uh, to fill in a feedback email and this will be sent to you after the presentation. It's very important too as well to receive your certificate of attendance and also for the next time, maybe you can enroll on to one of our wonderful webinars and you can submit those questions for our guest speakers. And just talking about our next webinar, our next webinar is going to be held on the 13th of November. Um, just check on our um, social media channels, on our Instagram and Facebook, and we'll send out some information for you. So thank you very much. And on behalf of the World of Optometry, I'd like to bring the presentation to a close and wish you all a pleasant afternoon or pleasant evening. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you.